Uh, so Juan Hernandez, uh, pleasure to be here. Thank you for, for inviting me. Uh, I've been at Bethel for 17 years, same time, same amount of time as uh, Kristen. And um, when she first approached me to talk about diversity, equity, inclusion, uh, it's it's not the kind of thing I would ever have been caught dead doing uh, long ago. Um, it just wasn't my wheelhouse. It wasn't the kind of thing that was that I was interested in, although I was clearly bilingual, bicultural, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, so when we talked about it and about the needs and batted some ideas around about exercises and whatnot, yeah, I just wasn't interested in role playing and, and talking about trigger words or anything like that. I said, if if I have a chance, this is what I would do. I would think about my time at Bethel and think about all of the Hispanic stereotypes that I have encountered that have actually shaped every decision I've made, right? Uh, perhaps unbeknownst to a lot of you, there are calculations you make based off of how you are going to be received in a particular place, right? If you are a female, you may know what it's like to be in a male dominated world and that shapes, like it or not, how you think, how you speak, where you go, where you don't go. The same thing with people of color, same thing with people who are different. Any number of differences can apply to all of us. So I thought what would be helpful is a true story, a true story of Bethel. So this is a Bethel story, my story of how being aware of stereotypes uh, and confronting stereotypes has shaped my decisions in life, scholarship, teaching, and even provided opportunities that brought me here today. Right? So I first came here in 2006, right? And I was teaching my very first class. And of course, all I knew about Minnesota is Minnesota nice, right? And uh, you know, they give you directions everywhere except their house. Uh, and I also had never been to the Midwest, so I assumed there were corn stalks here. That was it, right? So I get here, everybody's nice. It's like a nice place to be. I'm teaching my first class and it's my first semester. And, um, and of course, you know, it, now I call on people deliberately in my classes. I don't wait for you to talk. You know, I'll call on you. Uh, but back, I didn't know any better back then. So I just, you know, solicited responses. It was just crickets, right? Uh, so I was talking about the book of Revelation. In particular, I was talking about some manuscripts. And uh, as you may know, the Bible was copied over many years in manuscripts. And sometimes the words get changed as years and years go by. So I was talking about the name of Jesus and how Jesus in some manuscripts gets expanded to Jesus Christ or Lord Jesus Christ, right? And so you have the tradition kind of expanding and it's clearly a, kind of a, a move of reverence, right? We're doing it because, you know, we revere him, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm asking the class, they're saying, hey, uh, why do you think, without telling them it's about reverence, why do you think uh, that a scribe or scribes were expanding the name of Jesus, right? Of course it's crickets. Nobody's answering. Nobody cares, right? I barely care. I just, I just got to get through the class, right? And so, uh, I mean, I wasn't even, I was so new. I wasn't even using my own syllabus. I was using a syllabus that I had read like the week before, and I was just going to jump in the pool without a life jacket and without swimming lessons. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so I'm asking, and then this, this one kid in the back who never spoke in class, his body language was always disinterested. This is the, the one time he decided to speak. He raised his hand. And of course, I'm thrilled. Like, okay, I'm going to volunteer, right? And he says to me, well, maybe the reason why the scribes added names to Jesus was so that I could tell the difference between Jesus and the Jesus that serves me breakfast at McDonald's. Mm -hmm. Right? So it was a clear racist statement directed, I mean, there were no other Hispanics in the class. There was only one other Hispanic in the class, me, right? And so it was an opportunity for him not to talk about the text, not to talk about, you know, the Bible, but about how he gets served by Hispanics named Jesus, right? And I knew at that moment, and again, this was, you know, I was green, I was brand new. I, mean, I was already angry anyway, you know, because I'm new and I'm just out of a PhD program. You're just on fire till it cools off, right? And so I'm looking at this kid and the room goes dead silent. I mean, people in Minnesota are quiet anyway, right? But then it's, I mean, it was like palpable. You could feel it, right? And I knew at that moment that whatever I did was going to define the rest of my stay here at Bethel. I was either going to murder him, it's not a good idea, right? Or I will choose to, to just kind of, you know, dismiss it, 
right? I, I decided not to uh, dignify it. That's the word. I, you know, and I just said, not even close. And then just kept on with the class as if nothing had happened. But it was a reminder. It was a reminder of the stereotypes that are out there, that are held there. And, you know, his problem was that he actually said it. And he was bold enough to say it in class, in public. And it was directed clearly at me, right? And the only thing that any student ever said at that moment was there was one student who just said, oh, that's cold, right? That, that was it. Nobody came to defend. Nobody said, that's inappropriate. Who do you think you are? I imagine today, hopefully it's a little different, right? Maybe not. Maybe, maybe today I murder him. I don't know. Uh, but so, so, so that was my, that was my baptism. It's a Bethel nice, you know, Bethel, the house of God, you know, Minnesota nice. There it is right there. You, you Hispanic lowlife. So um, that of course, um, strengthened my resolve that I've always carried with me to essentially be the scholar I wanted to be, right? To, to do the work that I wanted to do. And also to solidify my place at Bethel, right? I was here to teach. I was here to be a scholar. I was here to write. I didn't want to get involved in these distractions. And so for the next decade, I didn't get involved in anything related to diversity or, 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 or at training or doing things in Spanish, nothing. I was just, I'm here. I'm a professor. I'm doing my work. I'm publishing my books, publishing articles. Uh, that's what I want you to know about me. Because the other thing is a liability, right? And not that I was ashamed of it or anything like that. Just, you know, you got people like that, fine, right? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to blow past that. And it's not just the kind of thing that, you know, Bethel makes you aware of, right? Um, and by the way, these kinds of things happen all the time. Right? I just happen to have been probably the one professor that saw in real life because I was brand new. Um, even before, even before I came here, you, you know, you, re you don't realize the stereotypes you're aware of until you confront a situation where you wonder how people think about you. I'll give you an example. Before I came to Bethel, actually before I went into the PhD program at, at Emory University, that's where I did my PhD in Atlanta, uh, I, got, uh, I got accepted into Atlanta to do the PhD over there. And so we had to call ahead, right, uh, to get an apartment, right? And I remember telling my wife, I was in Massachusetts, we were going to drive all the way down to Atlanta, telling my wife, when you call, right, make sure you tell them, right, that I am a PhD student, right? And she's like, why, why do they got to know all that about you? You're a PhD student. I said, what do you think they're going to think when they hear Juan Hernandez wants to rent an apartment from you? Like, what scenarios, nightmare scenarios are going to be playing in some of those brains about racist attitudes, right? This is the South, who knows, right? Maybe they think you're undocumented. Maybe you're going to mess up their house. You got your whole family in there. I mean, any number of things. And these are things I've heard and seen and known. So I just said, you just tell them, right? That I'm a PhD student. She thought I was ridiculous. She always thinks I'm ridiculous, right? And so, so that was it, right? So we're driving down finally, we're driving down to, to uh, uh, Atlanta and we're passing through the Carolinas. And as we're driving through, of course, the radio's playing, there's a commercial that comes on. And the, I kid you not, this is what the commercial said. Hola, mi nombre es Juan Hernandez. I would like an apartment. And I said, Joof. housing discrimination is a crime, right? And literally, I had someone with my name, with my name being the example of someone who is going to be discriminated for housing. Right? And I turned to my wife, you see, I told you, I told you, it's on the commercial. And he speaks, I mean, his accent is thicker than mine, right? I'm, I'm, you know, I, I, I don't have an accent, I think, right? Uh, so that was that. And so, so you carry that. And, and as you carry that, you carry the burden of trying to do, be better, more excellent, do twice as much, be twice as good because uh, the people around you work half as much and get credit. So you, you see that. So I'm here at Bethel for 10 years and I'm happy to you know, do my thing. And in 2015, 2015, we had a Hispanic Heritage Month celebration in chapel, right? And I never go to these things. I, I don't know what to do with these things. You know, it's always festive and colorful and all this kind of stuff. And I'm just a curmudgeon. You know, I don't care. You know, I, I mean, I'm fine, but you know, I, you don't need to celebrate me. I'm okay, right? Uh, uh, <laughs> and plus, you know, I don't know that I want to go to a Bethel celebration Hispanic for my first introduction, right? Like that's the that's the thing I want to know about, right? So, but I decided to go this time. Probably one of the few times that I've gone to chapel. Don't tell church relations, uh, <laughs> because I knew the speaker. The speaker was someone who I had known for decades ago. He lived on the East Coast, back kind of the East Coast. And, and so I recognized the name and I was curious, well, what's this guy gonna say, right? 
And he's Hispanic, he's a Puerto Rican guy. Anyway. So I go to chapel. And, uh, you know, he's doing his little song and dance, his little preaching and stuff. It's great, right? You know, Hispanic character, very festive, right? Um, and his whole ministry, his shtick, his thing is about making a place for immigrants, right? His whole thing is about welcoming the stranger and that kind of stuff. And, and that's fine. That's great. I mean, I get it. That's the kind of thing you want to do, right? But in order to sell it to a predominantly white audience, what you have to do is inject a little humor so that Hispanics don't seem like they're dangerous or they're criminals, right? And so there's usually analogies about tacos and salsa and, you know, this kind of stuff. And I'm sitting there, you know, I'm a PhD for heaven's sake. I'm not a taco, right? <laughs> and so so I'm, I'm kind of understanding that he has to do that to sell it to this audience, but that also plays into stereotypes. And so I was kind of like, oh, whatever. And so I just walked out. I mean, it storm out or anything, right? And it just dismissed the whole thing, right? So about an hour later, uh, I'm walking by the East Little Room, right? The hour of the chapel. And what cat what catches my eye? There's Mr. Speaker. And he's sitting with the president. And there's a room full of Hispanic uh, pastors and leaders and all this kind of stuff. And by the way, I wasn't invited to any of that. I mean, you would think that Hernandez, right? You know, there's that, that name alone says get in there, right? Didn't get, but I didn't, didn't matter to me. I wasn't giving off those vibes anyway. They probably thought, well, he wouldn't want to come. However, I don't know what possessed me, but I felt like this guy is in my terrain, right? He's out there saying these things, which again is to curry favor. I get it, but I don't like it. And before I could ask myself, what are you doing? I was walking right towards that table to where he was with the president. So, I mean, so, you know, I could get killed by a guard for that, right? You go towards the president, right? <laughs> so so I, I go and I just say to the guy, hey, I know you. And he's looking at me because this is decades ago. Okay, it's a lot better than this guy. Un unrecognizable. And, and uh, he's looking at me kind of like, like, you know, and then I said, no, this is your nickname. So I told him his nickname from back in the 90s, right? This is your sister's name. This is your wife's name. This is the church you used to go to. And he just is white, like, oh my God, like where this guy knows me from, right? And I, you know, I don't know if he's hiding sins. I don't think so. But, <laughs> but it's kind of, you know, this guy knows me. It's kind of like Nathan and, and David in the Bible. You are that man. Like, oh no. Okay. Uh, so, so we started talking and all of a sudden, you know, I, you know, I find myself sitting in, right there. President looks at me kind of like he's annoyed, right? You know, because I just barged in. Nobody invited me. And then I took the head of the table. And, and then the, the table erupts into Spanish because the pastors, they all speak Spanish. And uh, one of them in particular was the best friend of my college roommate from years ago. And he's like, oh, tú eres Juan Hernández, blah, blah, blah. And he knew me too. So there were two people that know me from decades ago. So and at some point, the president said, you want a plate? I got to repeat. I'm like, no, 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 I'm just, I'm just here to, you know, and then I left. I literally had no goodwill. Like I wasn't in there to be like, this is how you should do Hispanic Heritage Month. And other. I just wanted to let the guy know, hey, I live here. I work here. Just remember that, right? Completely dumb, right? It was just, it was just, you know, like mark your territory, if you know what I mean. So I left. I left and thought nothing of it. I was going to continue with my song and dance, continue my scholarship, continue my teaching, not worry about all this nonsense, blah, blah, blah. An hour later, it happens in an hour apparently in my life, uh, <laughs> Ralph Gustafson, who worked at the seminary at the time, Church Relations, sends me an email. He says, hey, Hernandez, after you left, you know, pastors were wondering if, if it would be possible for you to give a seminar in Spanish right, on the Bible. Right? And I saw that email. I thought, oh. right? Now, mind you, it's not that I had have not done that kind of stuff. Right before coming to Bethel, I preached and I taught in Spanish churches. I grew up bilingual, bicultural. My parents were Puerto Rico, right? But here I was just basically doing my career thing. And as far as I could tell, it was a liability, right? And, but I had felt when he had sent me that email that, hmm, you know what? I have established myself. No one's going to say you're not a scholar or you're not published or not. And I said, so, you know, I could do this. So I said, fine, let's do it, right? And he said, oh, fantastic, right? And, and, and again, you know, he's, you know, uh, he's upper middle class. He works in upper middle class white churches. So he had all kinds of ideas about what I should teach, right? And then and he's like, oh, you could do a class on administration. And so I was like, oh, first of all, I don't have time to do extra stuff. 
right? I, all I'm going to do is teach the material that I teach students at Bethel. So I'm going to take those PowerPoints and I'm going to teach those pastors in Spanish. So the class is going to be in Spanish and the jokes are going to be in Spanish. And that's it, right? Nothing else, right? And then the other thing was that most of these people come from a different socioeconomic status. They don't own their own churches. A church administration is not necessarily a thing that's foremost on their mind, right? Uh, they're excited about the Bible. So, and God bless uh, uh, Ralph, he was fine. Said, okay, good, whatever you want, whatever you want. So that was planned for the spring of 2016. 2016 rolls around the week before, and the goal is to have at least 40 registrants, right? So we could cover the cost for the room. And, you know, I, I don't know what's going to happen. I don't even know these pastors. This is my, I don't know any of these folks, right? Again, I had not associated with any of them. And uh, I start getting emails from Tracy Rudd, who was the assistant. And she says, okay, we got 10, we got 20, we got 40. We got 50, we got 80, we got 110, we got 125, we got 133. We had 140 pastors, leaders, and church members sign up for this seminar. And it was at eight in the morning on a Saturday, and you had to pay to be there, right? And so, you know, it's not like I was handing out healings and stuff and saying, oh, you come, the Lord's going to bless you. No, you come, I'm going to charge you. You can hear me drone on for three hours, and then I'm, I'm gone. Right. That's it. Right. I get a very bad attitude about the whole thing. Like, I'll do it, but I'm not happy about it. So so I did it and I did my teaching. Of course, you know, when it comes to teaching, you know, I enjoy teaching. But I literally just took material right out of my intro class, brought it into this class. And let's talk about Pauline Thanksgivings. And I'm putting up Greek words here and there. Right. And so the interesting thing is that that intrigued them. They were interested in that. You know, these are people who are in the pulpit every Sunday and they're seeing squiggly marks from Greek. And it captures their imagination. And next thing you know, they wouldn't let me take a break. I had a break scheduled. It's a three-hour deal, right? And they would come up and they would mob me. They would not let me go. They would not let me talk. And then after lunch, they're like, hey, can we come back? We come back and have more of a seminar. I'm like, well, you can come back, but I'm not going to be here. Right? I'm <laughs> out of here. So that was our first seminar. And it was unprecedented, right? And, and so what was interesting is that the stereotypes I had encountered now worked in a different way. Right now, I was if I was going to do this, I was going to do it my way. I was going to do it in a way that did not further stereotypes, right? And what ended up happening, they wanted another one. I'm like, okay. I thought it was going to be a one-time deal, right? And then we did that one. It's, oh, can we have another one? I said, okay, hold on. We got to draft a little, little, a little contract here because, uh, you know, this is getting taking up a lot of time and you know how it is there's job creep and it's kind of like oh you're so special you're so great could you do this could you do this and next thing you know you know you're not getting anything right so no you want me to oh, you gotta pay so school and i kind of came up with a contract and so we started to do these three times a year we've been doing this three times a year for the past seven years the attendance has always been between 60 and 160 people and we've never had to cancel there was even snowstorms where I was saying, we should cancel. And Ralph's like, no, we should not cancel, right? And then people showed up, right? People like from Fairbowl, right? I mean, we're not talking about people that, that live in the, you know, campus housing, right? They're <laughs> far away. And uh, and so 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 that's that's kind of what's happened. And here's the thing about those families. Those families, uh, they're younger than your typical white family. So they bring their kids. So there are women where they're breastfeeding and there's kids getting you know, a little, little hit on the head for, for moving around too much, right? And I've got pictures of, of you know, the people that came with kids who grew up coming to these seminars and ended up enrolling in Bethel. So in other words, that became, that open door became a conduit or, you know, for the, the, the like a pipeline for students, Hispanic, Latinx students to, to see Bethel. And that was the other thing about this effort. At first, they kind of wanted to ship it over to the seminary. And I was like, no, it has to be in CAS, right? It has to be in CAS. Why? I want CAS people to see them. And I want them to see CAS people. These folks are not from another planet. They've lived in this country, in this area for decades. And the, the socioeconomic differences are such that they would never cross paths. I wanted them to be seen. I wanted them to see them. Furthermore, all of this was taken off especially during 2016 and after, where the political environment, if you remember, I don't know if you guys were tiny by then, um, was, was a toxic environment of anti-immigrant sentiment. There was violence. There was saying, 
they're rapists, they're murderers, all kinds of awful things were being said about Hispanics. And people were not making a distinction whether you were documented or not. You were Hispanic, that's, that's a problem. Uh, you speak Spanish, that's an unwelcome language, right? That was the environment. And that only made me double down more and say, we're having them at CAS because I know that there are people here at Bethel who hold some of these views. I know there are people who align themselves politically with this kind of hatred, right? And so here are brethren in the Lord, brothers and sisters in Christ, right? I would like you to treat them like a neighbor. And I would like those people to see how you live, right? And so the whole thing became not just an opportunity for networking, teaching Spanish and all that, but it, it essentially allowed me to take vengeance right on the, the remark they're only good to work at mcdonald's right so no they're hispanic they do all kinds of jobs they are here right and they are they come into our class well this whole seminar thing so it's going on right after about three or four years the deans come to me and they're like hey hernandez this is really great blah 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 everybody loves it right would you want to do more right? that's the thing right you know you become the one person and you can do everything right and so I could tell that what they were kind of leaning towards was getting some sort of certificate program where, you know, pastors can take a class and then they get a certificate that you took a class on Timothy or what have you. And I literally recoiled at the idea. Why? Because the expectation and the assumption is that these people do not have college degrees or they do not have high school degrees. And so we all we can give them is a certificate. Right. And, and again, that's a noble thing. I said, but you know what? There are other groups out there as well. And there are some who do have high school diplomas and there are do, some who do have college diplomas, right? I said, so if you're gonna ask me to do something more, this is what I'm going to do. I wanna create a fully accredited university class that goes in the catalog and it's in Spanish, like legit. Like I have to do a proposal. I have to submit it to the committees. Janet has to approve it. And, and they're like, okay, let's do that. What class do you want to teach? And I, thought, I want to teach Greek, <laughs> Greek and Spanish, right? Which again is like, what? Like that, you know, it's a, how can you alienate more people, right? You know, you want to be the teacher, have a class where people come, you know, make it about something exciting, virtual warfare, some nonsense, right? They know it's going to be about Greek and it's going to be Spanish. Now, why did I do that? Again, the stereotypes play the role, right? The stereotype is often Hispanics are not academic. But they're not good at languages, right? In Greek, that's something for Germans to do, right? Kind of thing. And I was like, these people, right? And I could use these people. Right? These people, they already speak two languages, right? You know, this it's this is not going to be a new thing. It's just a matter of, and so um, they agreed. They agreed, and we set out the the registration and everything, and we had twenty four people sign up for Greek and Spanish. And they had to bring their, their, their high school diploma or GED to make sure they could take the class. And at the end of that class, they get a full three Bethel credit, you know, credit. You can go to a community college with that, right? It's not a certificate that doesn't mean anything. So that was my way of elevating and dignifying people that I thought, because I had experienced it and I see it, that are treated without dignity, right? That they are uh, marginalized and what have you. And this was my way. You want me to do something? For, this is how we're going to do it, right? And so, and then after that, we did an introduction to the Bible class and that built up. So for the last four years, you know, we've taught for two solid years, introduction to biblical Greek and the last well, at least two years, uh, introduction to the Bible in Spanish. And it gets better because what ended up happening, and this is the thing, once you, once you start opening up to possibilities and really working through it, new things happen. When the introduction to the Bible uh, um, proposal went through, it goes through a gen ed committee. And Gen Ed is made up of all kinds of people, right? It's not just my family member speaking Spanish is going to prove it, right? There's people, my enemies are there, right? And so uh, some of them decided on their own. They said, look, this could be a, a Spanish tag, right? So an introduction to the Bible was supposed to be a BIB 100 class, just a Gen Ed 100, also received an SPA, Spanish 300 level class. So if you were a Spanish major, you could take this class into the Bible in Spanish as an elective and it would count. And what happened when we first taught into the Bible? We had lily white Spanish majors, Minnesota homegrown folks right in there in the midst of all of these Latin Americans that are, you know, singing like a cracker and all that. You know, they, they were there. And, and so and what was interesting uh, is, and they were seniors, 
the environment changed where now the majority culture were these folks from Central Latin America, Mexico, and so and they were, I mean, they were thrilled to have Bethel students in there, right? And so we had students from the age of 18 to 84 in the class from all sorts of countries, including from cities in Minnesota. And I had them do group work and they had to speak. So all of a sudden, uh, the tables turned entirely from that scenario from my first class to now we have a room full of Hispanics taking a college credit course with normal CAS students. And the CAS students are learning from them. And the guy would come to me after class with one of those last name was Becker. That was called me by the last name. Like, red hair, super white, taller than everybody, <laughs> right? He, he did not stick out at all. So uh, he would come up to me after class, tell me how elated he was to be in this kind of environment because you're not learning textbook Spanish. I mean, some, you know, Jose makes a joke in Spanish, you know, you got to understand it's a laugh. You hear everybody laugh. What's the joke? Right? It's a whole different kind of thing, right? And so uh, as if that weren't enough, and what do we got? I got five. Okay, all right, because I, I just keep going and going and going. Okay, so um, uh, there was a, a pastor's kid, and this pastor would come to all the seminars, and his son was in high school, and his son wants to be a minister, right? And he, the, the pastor knew of me and all that. He came to the seminars, and he asked me, can my high school student son take intro to Bible in Spanish with you, like bilingual and all that? I was like, I don't know. I said, I mean, that's a PSEO thing, right? And uh, my thought was, no, there's no way, right? Because PSEO is not for religious courses. It's for you know, other things. But I, I, you know, I sent it up the chain anyway, you know, kind of just, uh, we'll see, right? Hail Mary passed. <laughs> well, the, 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 the provost loved the idea, right? And of course, you couldn't get funding because it's a, a sectarian course, a religious course. So Bethel decided to use its own money to the freight of cost. And we had an actual, actually, we had like two high school students, PC, PSEO, in introduction to the Bible in Spanish. So it went from being BIB 101 to SPA 300 to now a PSEO credit for a kid who will not forget that Bethel did this for him, right? And so, you know, long story short, all of this thing kind of turned into not just seminars and networking and classes, but also a pipeline for Hispanic Latinx students to know about Bethel and come to Bethel, right? And so, you know, you, you look now at where we are, we are about on the eighth year of the seminars. And I literally am the kind of person, I said this last time, that these things could end at any time, as far as I'm concerned. This wasn't my idea. I'm not always happy about it. I do it with a frown sometimes. But if the people come, I will do it. My philosophy is essentially the Willie Loman philosophy, right? You guys know Willie Loman? That last time was crickets. I assume crickets this time. Too. Death of a salesman. Nobody reads literature. Okay, good. But a <laughs> bunch of nurses in here. Nobody reads literature. So, <laughs> yeah, so they'll save a life. I, you know, I'll be dying. And they're like, you mocked us, right? And we we'll walk away. <laughs> oh, no. I'll tell you about the book. So uh, um, Willie Loman was, a, a, in his day, a great salesperson, right? But as he got older, kind of the shine wore off. He wasn't having the same sales. He was nothing like he used to be. And he was in the dumps and all that. And, and it's kind of where the idea comes, you're only good as your last sale, right? So at the end of the story, he kills himself, right? A very happy story, right? And so I talk about this whole thing as a Willie Loman philosophy kind of thing. In this sense, I don't see myself as in charge of this, right? I, I do this because the people have come, the opportunities are there. You ask me to do it, I'm going to do it in a way that will counteract some of the stereotypes because I think it's good for the folks. It's also good for Bethel, right? Uh, but you're only as good as your last sale. I am only as good as my last seminar. Once people stop stop coming here, I'm just going to care about me talking about DEI and whatnot. You know, where's the crowd, right? So you, you got to have a sober mind about you. But I will say this one thing. The whole thing has also changed me in this sense. When that student first made that racist remark about Hispanics doing menial jobs, right? My immediate response was, this is directed at me. It's an insult, you know, PhD. I mean, it's a disrespectful, right? And, and, and the response is, that's a sweeping generalization. You know, um, there are also PhDs, there are also scholars, blah, blah, blah. Seven years on now, we're literally, we have all of these Latinx Hispanic people coming. I can now say proudly, yeah, some of them do work at McDonald's. 
and they have other kinds of jobs and they do other kinds of things. And now they are welcome here. They can come here. They can take classes here. Their kids can come here, right? And you get that kind of population change. It's harder to say, oh, they're just other and they serve me. No, they now are here as part of Bethel. That's the story. Thank you for your time. Mm.